Uh, hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is James. Uh, I'm a founder of uh, D-Labs Games. And uh, it's such a great pleasure to have this uh, great guest today, tonight. Could you briefly introduce yourself, please? Hey, uh, my name is Frank. Um, D-Gods, Utes, NFT projects. Uh, started those and still running them. Yeah. My name is Farouk, founder of Rug Radio, uh, decentralized Web3 media ecosystem. Hi, I'm Pac-Man, one of the core contributors of Blur, the NFT marketplace for pro traders. OK, we have uh, you know, celebs of uh, NFT uh, space. Let me start with the uh, NFT 101. Uh, this might be a tough question. How do you define NFT? D digital property, I think, is probably the de best definition because it, it can be from everything from cartoon JPEGs to obviously representing ownership and physical, real-world assets, too. So, yeah, digital property. Bullish. Very. I'll tell you what they're not. They're not a scam, I promise you. You don't have to leave the room, <laughs> all the core dev and crypto people, I promise you. Uh, but, you know, I'll tell you, yeah, so, you know, for me, it's just like a product right? A great way to build infrastructure on chain to be able to either reward or build community, uh, you know, in a permissionless way. Yeah, I would say NFTs in their current form are primarily digital collectibles, but NFTs more broadly are effectively any non-fungible asset issued on a blockchain that can be a digital collectible, it can be a piece of artwork, it can be, uh, you know, real estate, a real world asset. Um, it's effectively a, a very broad standard that can be used for many different things. Uh, should we use the word NFT? Because, you know, in the market, it's kind of a negative vibe these days. I mean, crypto, NFT, scam. What do you think? You know, it's a funny question. A lot of things that happen in... Uh, NFT culture already happened in crypto culture broadly. So uh, if you look at Bitcoin, you know, very early on, Bitcoin was only associated with uh, like funding terrorism, like buying uh, stuff on the dark net. Um, you know, it was referred to as rat poison by Warren Buffett. Now you have Larry Fink, who's, uh, you know, heads BlackRock, shilling Bitcoin as digital gold uh, online. So ultimately, while there are different reputations that'll come and go, um, I think NFTs, uh, as like a verb, will, will probably stay, and the connotations will change over time. Yeah, I feel the same way. I know there's this big movement of like, oh, let's call it fucking digital, you know, goods or collectibles or whatever. Um, I, I think that you can't trick people into buying NFTs. I see that narrative all the time, and I think that, yeah, it's a good term. Um, it's definitely got some baggage to it, but let's own that um, and just make it better. I don't know, yeah. Yeah, just quickly, I think they're both right, but I like, think it's just an educational thing. Like what? NFT is just the underlying technology, right? Instead, you call it non-fungible token. That's all it is, right? And then on top of this, I think you gave the best definition of what NFTs are, but it's just, it's nothing else to it. I think we need to disassociate NFTs from just being like a PFP pump and dump scheme or whatever and show people that there's just so much more going on in the space. Okay, uh, my next question is, uh, what significance does the choice of mainnet hold in the NFT ecosystem? Maybe, uh, Frank, you, you've been through all this uh, Solana, Polygon, and ETH, and Bit Bitcoin. Yeah, I'm going to Salesforce next. <laughs> no. um, yeah, I think that each of the different uh, blockchains just have different communities, different tribes. So they all have their own unique properties. I think Ordinals is fascinating. I think Polygon is making some really big progress on some really big companies and big applications trying to do mass market stuff there. I think Solana has the best user experience. Um, and I think obviously ETH is where today what I would categorize as you know, digital native, uh, internet native NFTs are living and where most of the liquidity is. And so I think that it makes sense to me that it, most, you know, most NFTs are gonna end up on ETH that people like or are popular. But I think that each of the different blockchains are gonna end up having their own tribe, their own ecosystem. Um, like, I think the creator pass thing that's going crazy right now is uh, on Near Protocol, you know, so it's gonna be a mix of business development and uh, unique properties of these different blockchains, but yeah, they're all gonna have 
digital goods on them. Yeah. Uh, Pac-Man, uh, Blur only adopt ETH right now, right? Do you ha have any plan to expand to other mainnet? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, just to add on to Frank's answer, I would say one way of thinking about uh, you know different smart contract blockchains is effectively as digital cities. And if you were to rank ETH, it would effectively be the the New York City of blockchains. Um, so of course, there's going to be other cities. There's going to be businesses popping off in them, but um, you know, there's there's one number one city, New York City, is where all the liquidity is, is where the biggest projects are going to be. Um, you know, for Blur, similarly, when we started building Blur, we focus on ETH because that's the biggest ecosystem. Over time, we you know will expect to expand to other ecosystems, uh, but of course, I think that there's still a lot more to build in ETH as well. Um, so we'll focus on ETH and of course expand over time. I think you meant Seoul, Korea, right? Number one city. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think it depends what you collect, right? Like, if you're going to collect, like, a digital collectible, like he's saying, like Frank is saying, like, I think the CryptoPunk is a great example in Ethereum. And, like, obviously, you moved your assets to Ethereum, I think, for an obvious reason. Mm. Huge fan of that. And then you have the Ordinals right now that are popping. And I think, for me, like, I'm a big Rare Pepe collector, and mm. I love the fact they're on Counterparty. Mm. But it depends. Like, I don't really care for the rest of the stuff, per se, like, on which chain they are. Yeah. As long as I think they're going to be on a chain that's going to survive and exist uh, yeah, in, yeah. In, in 10 plus years. But mm -hmm. I think most people will not know anything about the underlying mm -hmm. technology uh, mm -hmm. where they collect their, their yeah, collectibles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And next question is, we all know there's a liquidity problem in the NFT market right now. Um, I wonder how serious it is and how, how we can overcome uh, this is the challenge. Maybe uh, Pac-Man is a platform? Yeah. I think if you look at crypto more broadly, you can see that there's a dearth, a lack of liquidity right now. Right? If you look at uh, even like crypto exchange volumes, like they were the lowest, lowest in August uh, that they have been in many, many years. Um, you know, ultimately, if you've been through multiple market cycles, this entire market operates in different market cycles, you know, bull and bear cycles. In bull cycles, the amount of liquidity is just off the charts, it's insane. And then in bear cycles, it feels like everything's you know, gone away. It's all relative at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, we know that the, you know, the cycles will come back. There will be another bull market. There will be more liquidity flowing back. And even in this bear market, what's been interesting is that the liquidity is still quite impressive. You know, if you look at even just like NFT marketplace volumes, um, you know, the daily average on OpenSea is around two to three million. The daily average on Blur is around seven to eight to eight million. So let's say, you know, $10 million in daily trading volume for digital collectibles. If you told this to a lay person, I think they'd be quite surprised at how much economic activity there is, even in this bear market. Uh, but of course, as someone who's been in this market, it feels uh, like it's empty right now compared to where it was. Um, you know, ultimately, the liquidity in bear markets just dies down, but liquidity also comes back in bulls markets. Frank, do you have any comments? I think you summed it up. Like, I saw yesterday a tweet that was showing the exchange volume on, on, for major central exchanges, and it mirrors, like, it, it basically mirrors the NFT volume. So I think that is going to be solved in what Pac-Man described. I also just think, and I'll talk about this more, it's just a retention problem. Like, we just have a deeply leaky bucket where most people that are the most passionate about NFTs, like a lot of people in this room, are not satisfied with where they're at today. And so if this is getting, every day we're literally losing users in NFTs, um, I think that we need to just make the people that are here happier and more satisfied with the experience, and that's gonna make it a lot stronger um, as macro trends trend, trend upward. But there's a deep correlation, honestly, between broader crypto and NFTs in volume, yeah. Okay, now let's uh, talk about uh, creator royalty. That's kind of sensitive issue. I think, um, uh, Frank, can you, as a creator, can you talk about your opinion? Maybe some yeah. history or some background? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's crazy because there's a lot of people that put words in my mouth on this, and uh, I actually like royalties. We have an NFT business, like, it's great. I love the revenue uh, that comes in. But I think that, and I, I made a whole blog on this that nobody talks about, it's long as fuck, so maybe that's part of why. But th to me, the real problem is actually just the fact that creators can set the, the number percentage. Because it's this massive variance that you have. Some projects have 
2%, some products have 9%. And if you think about a lot of people that use Blur, a lot of people that use marketplaces, if we want them to be trading between collections, like going from mutants to D-gods to doodles to whatever it is, if all of them have this huge variance uh, across the board, I think it makes it really challenging uh, to see how that's gonna work. I'm a big proponent of like a flat percentage, whether that's 1%, you know, obviously right now on Blur and OpenSea it's 0.5%. Um, I just think that if creators are able to set the royalty percentage, there's nothing that really backs that number. Like no business is going, oh, off of people leaving, which is essentially what happens when people sell and that's when royalties are collected. We're gonna like model out that we actually need 6% or 4%. I think that it's a nice to have in perpetuity, um, but yeah, I just think the flat percentage would make sense. And, you know, Pac-Man, I think we've uh, talked about it before, but that if the marketplaces come to an agreement, like we have this invisible agreement at 0.5%, I feel like if we bump that up to 1%, you know, it's too marginal of a difference to move all the listings is the hope. And we can double, you know, current royalty revenue if we move it up. So that, that's what I'm a proponent of. But I do think the creator setting the percentage makes it really, really tricky. And obviously on Solana, I've seen that happen. I've seen it go to 0% and then that sucks. And now it's enforced on the contract, on the protocol layer, but volumes are deeply down, you know, cause you just have this slippage and it's not like NFTs are pumping today. And so if you're gonna take a 5% cut or hit on the trading of it, like most people are not incentivized to do that. And those pro traders that use platforms like Blur, as much as we might hate on them or people in the community might blame them, you know, they do drive a vast majority of the volume every day. So I think that it's a really, really tricky subject. And to me, I think the best solution is a, a flat percentage. Yeah. Yeah, Frank, uh, is one percent or 0.5 percent is uh, enough for the sustainability of the uh, PFP NFT foundation? <laughs> Maybe for yeah. like a blue chip uh, and a project like DGATS or like a BAYC, but like a new NFT, PFP NFT projects. Yo, know, it's something that, again, controversial. People hate me for this uh, take all the time. But, I mean, I do think that it was just way too good for way too long. You know, like, there's some projects that made tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars uh, on royalties alone. And, and honestly, like, I, I do think that number just needed to go down. Um, it was just so insane. And so I, I wouldn't mind, like, I, on Solana, it went to 0%. We were just in like 0% land for a really long time. So even seeing 0.5% has been pretty great. I'm like appreciative of it. I know a lot of projects hate, uh, are upset about 0.5%. I'm like, holy shit, 0.5%, that's lit. Um, so uh, in a lot of ways, I think people need to get creative. I think a lot of NFT projects that will do well in the future probably won't even have a business attached to them. Mm -hmm. Truthfully, you're seeing what's happening with Remilia Corp or Miladies and different kind of c cultures within NFTs that I don't think need a central business uh, to become more popular. So again, I'm, I believe, I'm a big believer in the NFT renaissance that's gonna come up pretty soon where people are gonna okay. challenge the status quo across the board. And I would love more royalties for all creators. I do think that it's a really, really tricky subject. And uh, yeah, there's no yeah, right answer, yeah, truthfully. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Farrell, you have some, something to comment? I think it's a really tough one, right? Uh -huh. And I'm sitting next to royalty killers, both sides. <laughs> Um, obviously playing, obviously. but you know, and I just, I stand in a different position where like I was brought into the space like early 2021 mm -hmm. and before the whole like meta exploit with the board of Yacht Club and, and all that stuff right before that. And like the person who taught me when an NFT was when I was like, thank you X, for example, like Ferocious, Fuck Render and whatnot, it's Beeple, it's like all the artists. And where I stand is like, I, I just find it, it's hard for me as a, whether it's a marketplace or a network participant to tell a creator what they should set the royalty at. And I came into this place on the premise that an artist, also it's also weird because you have the PFP projects and the companies where I've just been traded on Blur, for example, and then you have the artists like Beeple, right? And so it's, I find it tough for whether it's OpenSea, Blur, or any marketplace. It's a weird position there because you can't really tell a creator what to set the royalty at, right? If Beeple wants to set a royalty at 25%, then that's either his for his better, like good or bad. It's his problem, right? So I, I have a hard time telling your creator or project founder like myself or Frank what their royalty should be set at, right? But again, there's also the whole premise of like decentralization, the free markets and the trading and whatnot. So it's like such a weird thin line, but I just will never be able to tell someone else what they should set the royalties at. And I think we should just leave it be. I do agree that the minimum set is a little low. Maybe Pac-Man or OpenSea or whatever can comment on that. 
But I do think that it's very hard that we have kind of, I feel like we've dragged the market down a little bit. I mean, there's a lot of statistics that are out there. I know NFTs are down bad because also I think your stats is right. All of crypto is down. Centralized exchange volumes are down. But one stat that will always like stay, and which is true, is like ever since the whole royalty debate started, NFTs have only gone down. And it's only been downhill for project founders. I don't rely on NFT uh, royalties for Rug Radio to make a dime. We marked it at zero a year ago. We said, we're just going to assume we're never going to make a dime. But I work my ass off. And I do, think that I, do, my, I do think that Rug Radio does deserve, let's say, 7 or 5% royalty that I put on there. And I don't think it's anybody's choice to tell me what I should set my royalty as. If I want to set it 10%, I'll do it. You don't have to buy it. You don't have to trade it either. Because I'm not selling NFTs for you necessarily like a trade up. Like, I don't want necessarily my assets to be tradable like on a day to day basis or farmed. Like they're being farmed at the moment, right? So it's like this weird thin line that we're in. But again, I think people made the best point on the NFT like royalty debate, which is like it's always going to be a merit system in a way. And maybe we can incentivize people who pay the royalties. We can create like models where like maybe marketplaces start like, I don't know, tagging people who pay the royalties and whatnot. So it's like a weird debate because like when NFTs came out, it's like the artists and the PFP projects and the utility projects are in one pot. And in some places, like, you know, if someone rugged their project and whatnot on the way out, I don't really feel like paying them the royalty, you know, because they left, right? But in a way, when it comes to an artist, again, I was brought in on the premise that like, my friends, like, maybe the day they go, like, their kids and their kids' kids and kids' kids' kids, because this amazing technology, are always going to be able to be entitled to this technology. But I'm also a utopist, so it's mm. kind of a different position I'm in. That makes sense. Uh, Pac-Man, do you have it? <laughs> Pac-Man, yeah. any comments? Yeah, the, the royalty conversation is always interesting because there's a lot of nuance mm. to the question. And usually from the participants involved, there's a binary answer that everyone wants, yeah. but the reality is it's, it's very nuanced. Um, Beeple is actually a great example. So I've had great conversations with him. He, he actually has um, uh, at least self-proclaimed a bit of like a hot take around royalties where he shared that he thinks uh, you know, the royalty should be paid on the buyer's side, not on the seller's side. So he's expressed this viewpoint a number of times, but um, it's not necessarily popular, even amongst you know, artists that he's, he's close with. And I think the reason why it's such a challenging question is because you really have um, you know, four different participants, right? You have the, the marketplaces slash protocols facilitating the trade, you have the buyer, you have the seller, and you have the creator. And pretty much every participant has somewhat different incentives. Uh, and the question is, is there a business model or revenue mechanic that basically aligns the incentives across all the participants? Mm -hmm. um, and there isn't really a clear answer to that just yet. So for example, if you're the seller, if you're someone trying to you know, sell your NFT, exit the club, typically you don't really care about that club anymore, so you're trying to you know, minimize any fees. Um, if you're the, uh, and typically in, t in today, just for context, royalties are typically enforced on the seller end. So when someone you know, lists an item, they have to uh, set the royalty there. And then if you're the buyer, you're trying to enter the club. So maybe that might be um, you know, a better participant to try to incentivize to, to include the royalties for. Um, and then the creator, of course, typically wants to maximize the royalty. Uh, the marketplace um, might be a little bit more neutral or maybe wants to reduce, you know, depending on the, uh, the competitive dynamics between other marketplaces. So you have all these different participants, and so far there hasn't really been a, uh, a clear answer as to like, what is the, the optimal route. Um, I think, as, as Frank also mentioned, there are different types of NFT projects, right? So if you're like a one-of-one one artist, you're gonna have a different business model than if you're like a 10K PFP collection. And even if you're a 10K PFP collection, you know, if you look empirically, some of them have monetized off primarily off of mints, some of them have monetized off of royalties, some of them have monetized by launching tokens. Um, if you look at, you know, probably arguably the number one PFP collection, CryptoPunks, they famously, you know, don't have any royalties uh, whatsoever. So it's a very nuanced question, but I think the, the core root of the issue is that there's effectively four different participants, and it's quite complicated to figure out how do you align incentives between all the different participants. That's good. 
That's a really good point. It's, next question is uh, related to the uh, previous question. I mean, in case of, uh, let's say, there's the absence of uh, creator royalty, what would be the uh, future revenue model for the uh, uh, NFTs, PFP NFTs? Frank, can you? Yeah, I've been saying this for a while. I think NFTs are probably closest to the creator economy. And in the, in the creator economy in Web2, I mean, you're almost expected to just make, let's just use YouTube as an example, like free videos for the longest time, get better, and then you monetize it deeply later on in the process. And so for me, I think like we're going to see a lot of creative things around this. So for example, you can imagine, and there's some big companies that are doing this now. It's uh, the idea you mint the NFT, but they don't hit a blockchain. So they're just in a database. You get the utility, whether it's like you meet some celebrity or you, you know, are part. Like I think Autograph was a big one that did this too. And it's like later on down the line, then you unlock, you know, the NFT on a blockchain. My guess is like this becomes a lot more popular because it'll allow companies to sell digital goods experience the positive like insane net margins on that and then if if there's like a clear secondary market for it then they can unlock it where i think nobody enjoys the vibes right when you mint and then it's like just down only you know so i think there's examples there obviously we're doing stuff with sponsorships um and and yeah i just think it's gonna look different again some projects are doing gaming some are doing like lifestyle brand stuff so that's where i think it'll just get really really creative um across the board that's my guess I just think NFT founders realize that you just can't depend on like secondary sales to actually build a business, a sustainable one. And I think it's also a good slap in the face for a lot of people for what it's worth. It's like, hey, like, you know, you're not just going to make money on the trade of things. You actually have to build something, right? Uh, whether it's product or for us, we're in media. So it's obviously we sell media on maybe 70 plus creators across the Web3 NFT space. It's been doing very well for us. Or I know you guys have done product or different mints and whatnot. But at the end of the day, like, and we talk about this often with my co-host Osef and Mando on the show, but it's like, who in the right mind in this current market would want to even drop an NFT project? You're left with a burden of like five, 10,000 people who are going to bust your ass every single day if your price doesn't go up because they don't understand the fact that like something takes time to build. I think you guys all understand how tough it is to build something that works out. And also, you're not going to make anything on secondary. And primary sales right now, you're probably not minting out if you have a 10 year project, and it's probably gonna have to be the free meta that came and took over, Nakamigos, whatever, all this stuff. And they crushed it on royalties because I think it was like programs, so they have to, to get them. So it's just like, there's no point at this stage in time, it's super doomer of me to say it some, in, in some way, but I do think building a brand in this space is turbo speed and building a company on steroids. So there's no better place to do it than now in this space. So I still believe that, but nobody in their right minds wants that. Cause like, I mean, Frank gets yelled at every other minute, right? If something, if he does something, if he, you know, like just smiles wrong on this stage, probably someone's gonna yell at him or something like that, right? And it sucks, been in this position, right? Every single day of my life. So in the right mind, but at least we came at a time where we had a time where we could sell out on the primary. So I could build something out of that. And then the royalties left. So it's like, whatever, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, I'll figure it out, okay. right? Okay. But I think it's just about figuring out like secondary sources of income and actually building a sustainable business. It's no different than, you know, like, any other Web2 company, but going back to the first question you asked us when NFT is, we get to build on this new technology and we get to, I think, do it even better than, you know, people who managed to build brands before that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, make a brand and make a value out of it, out of it right? Um, so, um, last question I have is uh, also it's a challenge for the... Uh, Web3 gaming as well. Uh, we need a mass adoption. NFTs, we have uh, how many people we have? Uh, how many buyers? You, you, do you have numbers? Like eight, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. So They're all here. <laughs> yeah, daily, <laughs> daily probably like five to 10,000 in terms of uh, like unique participants, probably okay. like 50 to 100,000. Okay, what? So what would be the strategy or like uh, uh, ways to for the uh, mass adoption? I mean, in game we have uh, like three billion gamers, so um, you know only uh, we have three gamers. Just uh, how many? About three million. So we have a huge room to grow. So what what you what you think? Yeah. So this is another one of my I get hated on for this take as well. Um, yeah, I think the term mass adoption has become one of the, in the canonical, like, meaningless terms at this point. You have, like, 
utility, mass adoption, storytelling, NFTs, like whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the reason I say that is today we literally have a leaky bucket, right? It's like there's literally people leaving the NFT space every single day. And so it, it, the idea that somehow we're going to make the right marketing campaign and all of a sudden everyone's going to love NFTs, it's a little ludicrous. It'd be like saying you have a leaky fucking boat and you want to go get a million people to come, you know, be on that boat. And so I think it's a retention problem through and through today. Um, and how are we going to get to mass adoption? Well, it's like, how do we make NFT something that people love so much? Literally the people here and in the space care the most. Like they want to see NFTs win. We all do. And if we're unhappy and like people in the community and ecosystem are unhappy today, I, we can't expect moms in Idaho to fucking love NFTs, you know, tomorrow um, just because, you know, some pretty picture was posted or something like that. So I think it's just a retention problem, in my opinion, is where it starts. I think, um, you know, something that's very interesting if you look in the history of crypto is there's a lot of focus on mass adoption, but typically the way things get adopted is there's some new crypto native thing that takes off and then it attracts new people in. So if people remember back in 2018, you know, the market in 2018, the bear market, it was like dead, dead. Like there were no use cases, like nothing was really functional. Um, it was quite depressing overall. And then in 2020, we had DeFi, we had, you know, Uniswap, we had Compound, we had Aave, and they kicked off this entire DeFi summer. Um, you know, no one was really predicting that those things would be the thing that like draws everyone in. So it's very hard to predict what mass adoption looks like, but I think it's obvious to me that at minimum, it's gonna be some sort of new crypto native use case. It's really hard to predict what it is gonna be, but it's likely gonna start you know, from the crypto natives and then branch out from there. I agree with what they're both saying. And then to add to that, I think what's gonna help branch off, so first of all, like, I think a great example to what Pac-Man's saying is like Frentech recently. It's like adopted by all the crypto natives. Base is pushing it, Brian Armstrong, everything. And then you have you know, a bunch of, you know, I guess, normie creators come in and the next layer and the next layer. But I think to add on top of what they're saying is going to be creators. You know, I think like I, I do think creators are at the forefront of every single industry because you're talking about gaming. I mean, look at gaming. We had Daniel Allegra, CEO of Yuga Labs, on the show last week or two weeks ago, and he said it's you know he has a deep background in gaming, Activision, yada yada yada. And he was saying it was influencers. I think what he meant by that was with the creators creating content around the game. So that's when the early phase came in, and then like 100 thieves and this and this and that. So it's going to be creators. I mean, when you think about the bear market, blah, 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 and you're saying it was dead in 2018, I'm thinking about the bear market now. I've never been so entertained. Why? Because creators held it down. And for me, that's why our mission will always be to put creators first, creators forward, and empower them and build infrastructure around them so, so, so much that when the next wave of mass adoption or whatever comes, it's going to come at a point or another, but focus on the core creators mm -hmm. that are right now in this room creating content within the space are going to be what are going to bring the next... I don't know, millions of people, because they're like, oh, look at this guy, look at this thread guy, oh, he's cool, I, I fuck with him, I like his content, what's about NFT, he's cool, look at Frank, I like what he's doing, look at Farouk, his morning show, like, it's just like stuff like that, oh, I had to plug this show, right, but it's just like, you know, it's just like, I think it's going to be creators, and I genuinely mean that, and creators are artists, artists are creators, people is a creator, every day goes viral, yeah, 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 you have DK Motion, like, right now in Seoul, I was like, in, I think in Myeongdong or something, has a huge exhibit, right, but it's NFTs in the back of it, and then it's, what we're doing, et cetera. So I think it's really going to be heavily focused around creators. And that's why I think what Elon and X are doing right now is all about like yeah. actually rewarding these yeah, people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, in Korea, there are a lot of uh, NFT collectors as well. Uh, there must be some uh, collectors here. So my questions are done. So if you have any questions from the floor, it's, uh, it's a great time to ask because we have a... Uh, the hottest guys in the <laughs> NFT uh, industry. Yo. Is there any? Okay. Not bad. Thank you very much for your time. It was a great talk. Bullish. Thank you. Thank you.